the location that we chose was a titanium mine. And it has these black sanded beaches that kind of represent the colors of the moon. And then you have the habitat standing there as kind of like a, a black shiny pearl made out of, of carbon fiber with solar panels on it. So it has this shining quality to it. We placed it as far north as possible in, in the Arctic Greenland. Humans are evolved to live on Earth with natural sunlight. The sky is ever present and, and we wanted to, to, to create the same thing in our habitat. We needed the highest quality of light that we could get because we were not just going to live in it, but we were also conducting a study. We tried in a way to create the most realistic moon mission possible. I was invited to work on the uh, lunar project to write a roadmap for the evolution of lighting. Launching an experiment with uh, extreme conditions where people really missing daylight with people into the full darkness, we believe that it becomes very interesting because lighting becomes a unique source of well-being. Because of this extreme condition, we had to do something and provide light during daytime. So I designed a number of scenarios, seven scenarios actually, that were played every day on a random base. We expected to measure consequences of these scenarios on a number of uh, activities. One of the biggest interior design choices that we made was the lighting design. So what we actually did was we made an artificial sky inside of the habitat. The entire ceiling of the habitat would simulate a changing skylight, changing sunlight throughout 24 hours. And what was interesting was that the entire system was programmed from Denmark. So we didn't have any control over the days. The circadian light system in the habitat was really one of the most important things of making us thrive in such an extreme environment. We put these big panels and uh, they sort of just look like a skylight with diffuse light coming in. But there was a panel over each of our desks, uh, mounted on the ceiling, and then one mounted in the ceiling of the airlock, and then also inside our sleeping pods. We didn't have any windows in, inside the habitat. Once the sun set for good, the habitat becomes your entire world. And imagine a world where the sun doesn't rise and set. We had to create the whole experience in order to really examine or feel the stress of being there. Just the fact that this natural rhythm existed in the habitat made us able to carry out the mission. The first thing we, we have to do to express the the way the light affects our body is first to think that light has a number of attributes, which are the intensity, the spectral component, which is the color, but also at what time of the day this light arrives. And we also have a memory of light. They really stress the moment of the day, and I think that was quite interesting, which was sunrise and sunset. I'd open a window of dream to them beyond the seven scenarios, six lighting scenarios, which on purpose were very saturated, very colorful, and they were played every Saturday at a kind of Saturday party. And actually, from what I've heard from their analysis and what I read from their questionnaire, it was a rather good success, which shows that lighting can go much beyond the basic needs and quantities, it's also a powerful way to make your life more interesting. We've been working with light in pretty much any application imaginable. We haven't done space yet. But we had an idea that it doesn't really matter where you put human beings, that's going to be some correlation to what they like and what they prefer and what they don't like. So this was a great opportunity to, uh, to try it out in, in a real life project. Actually, quite often we are, by nature, ruled by the light and our mood is set by it. And this is where we came in and thought it was interesting to see how can we match 
what's going on in the sequence of light with something that's more decorative or feels more comfortable and warm. Following the, the case study we've done in our own offices and, and the knowledge that we have from all our projects around the world, we wanted to see if there was a correlation. But also we wanted to show and tell the story that regardless of how fast technology develops, our eye brain function, the way we react to light, doesn't really change very fast. It's evolution. We still perceive light exactly the same way we've done for thousands of years. We have the skylight and we have the fire. And that's how we build in our designs and that's how we try to plan design. Inside the habitat, as we moved towards the evening time and the sun kind of set, we started to turn on these small portable pantilla lamps. Having different light setups also helped us to create a space that seemed dynamic, but having smaller lights placed throughout, we could create a cozy and, and hugely atmosphere. Turning on the pantella lights sort of has the same effect of uh, lighting a candle yeah. in the evening. It was really a, such a, an atmosphere creator. And, and Hugo said it's a, it's a quality that you can't define. You know, architects, they can make something hugely, but engineers would struggle with that. Yeah. And that's kind of what we're trying to make it hugely while still having it work as an engineered habitat. Looking back at it now, it's impossible to imagine the expedition without the light. We are working with space architecture, we are working with outer space. And then people think that we are forgetting Earth. But if it's one thing that we learn as we work with outer space, it's just a growing appreciation of Earth, of nature, of people, of weather. Because living inside a pod where you're not in contact with rain or sunshine or all these things, then you really start to appreciate all these change of, of stimuli and variation. The more we look out and work with that, the more we just love Earth. <laughs>